Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Wistia. Take control of your video marketing with powerful tools and analytics built specifically for business. Go to wistia.com slash twist to get your free Wistia account today. And by InVision. Find out why so many hot startups are using InVision to prototype, present, and collaborate on design in real time. Sign up for a 90-day free trial at InVisionApp.com slash twist. And by AWS Activate, the Amazon Web Services startup program. It's easy to start and scale your business with AWS. Visit aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. And today on This Week in Startups, Cruise Automation. It's a startup here in Silicon Valley that is making an add-on kit that will go on your car and allow you to put your car on autopilot. Yes, you're going to be able to take your hands off the steering wheel, not use the brakes, not use the uh, accelerator, and drive in a straight line. And it will stop if you're going to get an accident. This is the new uh, step on the way to autonomous driving. You've heard of the Google cars? Well, before Google cars come, and they're 10 years out probably, we're going to have autopilot. And today we're going to hear all about a startup that in six months built a functioning autopilot. It's really fascinating stuff, uh, and it's really going to do an amazing, amazing number on the insurance industry because all these fender benders on the 405 and the 101, they're going to be a thing of the past. Stick with us. It's a fascinating episode. It's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't going to live like me. Until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you yeah. Money is the root of all evil what? Funny how it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you Hey everybody and welcome to This Week in Startups. It's your host Jason Calacanis and here we are again in San Francisco at WeWork. Thanks to my friends at WeWork for A, providing this beautiful studio where I get an interview any number of amazing founders, entrepreneurs, and today will be no different. Um, if you want to get a desk and pay like some really affordable amount of money, it's like 500 bucks a month or 600 bucks a month, uh, yeah, go to WeWork. They're, they're everywhere. I, I can tell you all the cities. is New York, San Francisco, Boston, D.C., Seattle, L.A., Chicago, London, all, all this stuff. They're everywhere. And they're crushing it. It's a beautiful place to work. And I have a desk here. It's actually where I work now when I'm in San Francisco. So thanks to our friends at WeWork for hosting us. And today on the program, a serial entrepreneur who has built automated software so that your car can, it's basically autopilot, I, I guess is how I would describe it. I'm interested, yeah. Kyle. That's what we call um, it. What you would call, you call it autopilot. A highway autopilot. Only works on highways. Only works on highways. So yeah. uh, the person you're hearing right now, for those of you listening, is Kurt, I'm sorry, Kyle Vogt. But it's spelled V-O-G-T. That's right. But it's pronounced vote. Mm -hmm. So Kyle Vote, uh, and you're with a company called Cruise Automation Incorporated. Yeah. We just go by Cruise. But you go by Cruise, and you can go to getcruise.com to see what they're doing. Um, but, you know, a video is worth a thousand words or a million words. So let's just play the video, and then you can tell the audience, and imagine some of these people are listening on the radio, what's going on here. Sure. Let's see it. Um, so here we are. We're at uh, the Alameda Airstrip. Just... Uh, it's basically a decommissioned naval airstrip, and we set up a half mile long course out of orange cones. And so right now I'm behind the wheel and about to turn on the system, and it's going to take over. Uh, adjusted it there, and at this point uh, the car is driving itself completely. So. And that's an Audi. That's an Audi. And, it's and then on the top, I see there's something on the top. What's on the top? Yeah, we're calling it the sensor pod. Um, all the sensors that the vehicle needs to see the road are mounted on top, right behind the windshield. Ah, oh, got it. So you put this huge thing on the roof. It's not huge, but it's. <laughs> No, not, it, it's it, not inconspicuous. It, look, it looks cooler than you know the, the spinning Google thing on top. You know, it's, right? Yeah, the Google more, thing more is subtle. ridiculous. Yeah. So there's something a little more subtle on there, but it's a big disc. Yeah. And so, what, what's in that disc? What what is actually going on up there with that huge piece of hardware? Like, what what is it the size of? If I was a pizza size, or what? A... Uh, it's about 16 inches across and maybe maybe eight inches wide. So it's okay. not not too big. It's not yeah. that big actually. Then. Yeah. So people take this hardware and attach it to an existing car? Well, mostly. We do the installation. So, oh, you do the installation. Yeah, and calibrate and everything for your car. So the idea here is, instead of waiting for self-driving cars to come from Google in what most people consider five to 10 years, mm -hmm. you could have like the ultimate cruise control on the highway? <laughs> is that how I yeah, might think yeah, about it? That, that's one way to see it. I mean, we, we see it more of like, almost like the lean startup approach applied to self-driving cars. And so we thought, what is the product we can build that 
uh, provides value to people, but is the most straightforward technically so we can bring it to market sooner. Um, and that's what we have here. So what have you built exactly? Because obviously when we get to something like self-driving cars and then you say something like lean startup, minimal viable product, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. people, there's a bunch of people who just spit out their coffee. Like, yeah. I don't really <laughs> want to have a minimal viable product driving my car. There, there's a difference between, uh, you know, pumping out a quick web app and building, you know, something that drives someone's car for exactly. sure. Exactly. Yeah. So w w what exactly have you built? Because we, we all know there is uh, adaptive cruise control. Mm -hmm which I believe the way that works is radar tells you how far the car in front of you is, keeps a certain amount of space, mm -hmm. and adjusts your cruise control. Yeah. So is that an accurate description of how that works? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea is- It is, is a you, laser. Uh, it's, a, it's a radar. Oh, it's radar. In most cases, yeah. Now, what have you built? So, and how is it different then? And what cars have that, by the way, that adaptive cruise? Uh, it's actually on several cars from all different manufacturers at this point. It's, yeah. it's pretty common. Do people use it? Uh, I have it on on one of these Audis, and I, I still haven't figured out how to use it. To oh, be honest. <laughs> okay. So, because you know, I, I hear that it's in some cars, but I don't ever hear about people using adaptive cruise control. Uh, I don't think it, it's like a really you know substantial change to the driving experience. So it doesn't mm -hmm. you know it doesn't move the needle. I don't think. All right, and then I guess the second feature of these things is staying in the lane. Right. Right. That's the hard one. Yeah. Okay. So now you do that too. We do. Yeah. Okay. So the adaptive speed thing that you do, that's been in the market for a couple of years now. That's yeah. not the unique piece to this, but the staying in the lane, that is kind of unique, isn't it? Well, yeah. And then when you combine the two, it, it's yes. totally different, right? So now you have a system where you get in the lane you want to be in on a highway, push a button, and then that's it. You, no hands, no feet, you just sit back. Wow. So how does it know to stay in the lane? Um, well, up top in, the, in that sensor pod, we have two yeah. cameras, a radar, a GPS, and some inertial sensors. So this whole suite what of What does that sensors. mean, inertial sensors, for the people who don't know? Basically the same thing you have in your cell phone. So you can move your cell phone around and it detects motion. Got it. Um, so we use that to, to see how your car is moving. Okay. So you know how the car is moving around, just like my iPhone knows how I'm moving around. Yeah. A little fancier, but you little know, same fancier. concept. Now you also know through... Um, the two cameras, mm -hmm. what? What are, the, what are the cameras for? These are just like webcams, right? Uh, they're, they're sort of specialized cameras for machine vision. And uh -huh. so what we're doing is looking for the lane markers on the highway and trying to calculate the car's position relative to the markers. Okay. So the camera is trying to figure out what's going on there. And so you said these cameras are different. Are they, how are they different exactly? The main thing is uh, they're a global shutter. Are you familiar with that? No, explain okay, that. So, I mean, uh, that's kind of why we're here is we want to yeah, understand. Yeah. Because you know what, here's the thing. If we accomplish anything in this episode, I would like the people who hear about all these self-driving cars to actually understand each component so that maybe we can all trust it a little bit sure. and feel like we want to push the button that says autopilot. That's right. Well, I, I can help. Yeah. So let's talk about that camera. Okay. You're saying the shutter speed? What was it called? No, it's called global shutter, and it's... Uh, it, it, the opposite of like a rolling shutter, which is what your uh, iPhone has in it. Okay. So for example, if you take your iPhone and you're trying to film something and you wiggle your phone around, uh -huh. if you play back that video, things will look like they're wobbling a little bit. Sure. And that's because as it's scanning across, reading the pixels, um, you're moving it. So mm. the, the pixels up in the upper left are different than when you moved your phone and down to the bottom right. But on a global shutter camera, it exposes all the pixels at once and sort of locks them in. So even if you're moving or a car is moving, you still have a perfectly... Um, you know, perfect image, I guess. Wow. So, yeah, it's, it would be, it's almost like, is it almost like when they send a drone up or whatever and they have like a steady cam and it like steadies it so you get a steady shot? Is that would be sort um, of the net net effect of it? Is that it has a steady image of the road? Yeah, but you you could have a, the, the camera itself steady, but... Um... Uh, no, you could still have problems with that. The global yeah. shutter is, so, so they're stabilizing the camera itself and then mm -hmm. also um, exposing the pixels at all at the same time, Got which it. are different. And so you have a computer now looking at the road mm -hmm. and then there's some kind of software that says that's a car, that's yeah. a lane. Right. Who wrote that software? How accurate is it? <laughs> Does that, is that like something I could buy off the shelf from somebody? <laughs> Um, we wrote the software, but we didn't write it from scratch. I mean, okay. autonomous vehicles have been an active area of research for 30 years now. 30 years now. Right? Yeah, there's some great videos from back in the 80s when they had like a minivan full of computers and it's like driving down a street. Um, you know, Google made this very popular, but it's, you know, it's pretty established science at this point. Why isn't, he, why isn't it here now? I mean, so you said you studied this before? Yeah, a little bit. Um, and so why do you think, you know, it started in the 80s and here we are... 30 years later, it's not here yet. 
Well, there's a number of reasons. Um, first of all, like back in the 80s, like I said, it was a minivan filled with computers, sure. literally. So, you know, Moore's Law helped a little bit, and now you can get that the amount of computation you need practically in your cell phone. Got it. Um, which has been helpful for us. The the other thing is uh, sort of DARPA, the government organization, organized a couple of robotics challenges, uh, one in 2004 and 2005, a desert race, and another yep. one in 2007, like an urban situation. And the goal was to write... Um, you know, software that would power self-driving vehicles, and there was like a million or $2 million prize. So that really got academics kicked into high gear and generated a lot of the research that's the basis for products like Google's self-driving car. And we saw those contests on TV. They were pretty yeah. popular. Yeah. And people did horribly. Like, they literally <laughs> couldn't drive across a goddamn parking lot, or, or the desert in this case. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, you had these MIT geeks underneath cars in the desert because the car couldn't drive in a straight line. Mm -hmm. It was completely embarrassing at that point in time. And that point in time was only, what, like eight, nine, ten years ago. Yeah, but things have accelerated since then, I think, yeah. because of that. Um, was, were all the innovations as part of that DARPA grant or DARPA prize? The, that's DARPA is the Department of Defense, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, that was it conditional that they all be open sourced or all be shared? Uh, Do you know? I don't, I don't know if that was a condition, but what happened is if you have universities or academics working on mm -hmm. this stuff, they all want to publish papers. So right. of course, after the DARPA Grand Challenge, each year, there was just like a you know, eruption of papers from all these you know, PhDs or soon-to-be PhDs wanting to share their research. Ah. Um, and so that has been in public domain ever since. So a couple of million dollars in prize money resulted in probably tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars in innovation to what could wind up being a multi-billion dollar market. I agree. One of the most efficient uses of taxpayer money. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. I'm sure yeah. there's a, a zillion libertarians, Republicans, Democrats, or whatever, who are like, oh my God, that shouldn't have been spent. Oh my God, that should have gone to education. Oh my God, it should have gone to my whatever. But in fact, this is going to really actually save a ton of lives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's 30,000 car accidents in the U.S. every year, or 30,000 deaths in the U.S. every year. Um, and I think this technology could help eliminate those. Now, when you say eliminate those, you mean zero um, or well, close to? I what don't do you know. I think in your heart. I, I think we're going to like reduce that number. I think getting to zero is hard because there's factors outside driving the car that can be dangerous on a road. Um, you know. Okay, like oil or yeah, whatever. or bad weather or bad like weather. those kind of things. Yeah. But what you know, like you're studying this space, Kyle. Like in your heart. <laughs> What do you think that number would go down? Half? You know, 10 years from now, we're sitting here 10 years from now, mm -hmm. and you've got your product in, you know, built into a bunch of cars, and you're a billionaire because your company went public, all this <laughs> stuff that is obviously going to happen. What is going to happen 10 years from now? Will we have 5%, 10%, 30%? percent What does Kyle think? Well, as we are today, people are very, very bad drivers. 93% of the accident of car accidents are caused by human error. So we're like texting on our phones or, you know, thinking about other things or didn't get enough sleep, whatever it is. Drinking, smoking drinking. weed, yeah, whatever, yeah. So, taking too many prescription pills. Yeah, so that basically means people are terrible drivers. Yeah. So if we can't, you know, use this technology and at least get, you know, maybe twice as good, then I think, you know, we've kind of failed as technologists to, to do anything here. So 30,000 to what? Give me a number. Kyle, in your heart, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. 10, 20. So give me 10 and already, give me 20. It's already trending downwards, the invention of like active safety features on modern cars. But let's see. 10, 10 years out. It'll be fun because people are going to watch this video and we'll have a 10-year, 20-year yeah. bet. Yeah, I hope I hope we're around uh, 5,000 10 years from now. Really? Yeah. 10,000. Okay, so five, you draw on the line at 5,000. Yeah. All right, when we get back from commercial break... I will take either side of that bet, the <laughs> okay. over or the under. Okay. I mean, we're talking about people's lives here, so I shouldn't be so cavalier. But it is fun as technologists to make this bet. Mm -hmm. And what should the stakes be? What should the stakes be, Kyle? What should we bet? $1,000? Is bet. this a 10-year bet we're talking it's about? A, this, we're doing a 10-year long bet right Boy. now on This Week in Startups Live. Maybe what we should do is... Is it money or like public humiliation? What are we doing here? I'm not into public humiliation, but it should have an aspect of that. <laughs> it should have an aspect of like, we go to sushi... And it is up to a thousand dollars in sushi for two, you and I. Okay. Thousand dollars in sushi, you and I. Lose, in, the loser pays. But yeah, the, of course the loser pays. But in a um, in a uh, in whatever the current year's dollar amount, right? Okay. So it's a thousand dollars today. Inflation adjusted. Yeah, yeah. inflation adjusted thousand dollars. So that might be like eight thousand dollars because the way the inflation is going. That that's the deal. Well, let me think about it. You're you want to do five hundred dollars? Maybe my, my, my mouth is. Um, 
I'm a gambler. I just gamble anything. But you no, said no, no, five. No. I'm going to pick the over or the under. So you don't even know if I'm going to pick under or over. Yeah, let's do that deal. Wait, okay. wait, wait. I don't know what, what side you're picking on. I, yeah, you pick, You you made the line. Yeah. So you picked 5,000. So uh-huh. now, depending on how accurate you made that line, you should have made it accurate, right? You're not sandbagging. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I'll, after the commercial break, pick if I'm taking the over or the under. It's All like, right. You know, All, right. All right. We'll be right let's, back let's do it. with our $1,000 who, how many people are going to die from car accidents in 10 years in the United States when we, on this week in startups? All right. You guys know I love video. And I hate, hate, hate having to put the beautiful videos we make here at This Week in Startups on somebody else's platform only to have them plaster it with ads and promotions for other stuff. I want to have a nice, clean, elegant, beautiful HD player for you, my loyal audience. And so when I was looking for a new platform to store our videos, I just literally tweeted, who can make me a white labeled for business video solution? Because I don't want to put my videos on any of these public sites. I'm not going to point them out, but you know the ones I'm talking about. I need a business solution that's clean and elegant where I own 100% of the real estate. And I can do things like ask you at some point in the video, would you like to join the This Week in Startups mailing list? Would you like more information? Would you like to subscribe? All of these things are done easily with Wistia, W-I-S-T-I-A, Wistia. Wistia is used by fine companies like MailChimp, Moz, Blank Label, and This Week in Startups. They have 50,000 customers. The founder is awesome. They're out of New England. And they built this company because they had, they had friends and clients who needed it. And those are the best startups, the ones who are built off of an actual need they see in the market. And we are so loyal to this product because it has given us the ability to every week, every day, get email addresses in the video. You can't do this on the other platforms because they're so greedy. They want to take all those users for themselves and get them as subscribers on their platform, and they won't share those subscribers with you, even though those subscribers are yours. Here, anybody who subscribes to the program, I get their email. And they can tell them, hey, who's going to be on the show next? And maybe you want to check this out. Maybe I'm having an event. Come to it. All of that is made possible by my friends at Wistia, W-I-S-T-I-A. And go to wistia.com slash twist, wistia, W-I-S-T-I-A dot com slash twist. And you will get uh, your first three videos for free. And no credit card is required. They have tons of support, unlike all these other free services out there. They'll actually pick up the phone and give you support. And professional videos and businesses need a professional site. It's got a ton of analytics as well. I could talk for days about it. But listen, it's a product we use. And then they chose, after we used their product for a while, to support us and become a partner with the program and have me tell you about how much I love the product. I really do love Wistia. And I have literally have 10 friends using it since I started using it uh, this year. So anyway, everybody go check out Wistia and thank at Wistia on your Twitter handles. Let's get back to this amazing program. All right. Hey, welcome back to This Week in Startups. It's your host at Jason Calacanis. You can follow me on the Twitter at Jason, or you can follow the show at TWI Startups. And actually, we're on the Instagram as well. Just search for This Week in Startups and you'll find it. Today on the program, Kyle Vogt is with us. He is with Cruise Automation, Inc. He's a serial entrepreneur who wants to save lives by building basically cruise control, just autopilot on cars. And he's not waiting 10, 20 years from now. He's, he's going to try to do this in the next... Yeah, we want to do this in the first half of next year, start shipping. The first half of next year, you want to ship this stuff. That's the goal. Wow. That's incredible, dude. Well, we're a startup going against $100 billion companies in this space. Our only advantage is speed. Okay. So, yeah, you're literally taking on Google. Well, in a way, although they're making the uh, smaller car. that's They're making the pod car. I think you think they're going to really make that pod car... Or do you I think know. that's just like a PR marketing Google X kind of thing? It's it's hard to say. It is Google X, right? So they they have this goal of building things ten times better than status quo. And yeah. I think the car makers are approaching what they had before, and so I think they wanted to do something more ambitious. Right. But are they doing that ambitious thing to actually produce the cars, or the ambitious thing to get the car manufacturers to move faster? Mm, I don't know. Are you asking like whether you think they'll actually produce that car and sell? Yeah. Do you think they're going to produce that car and put a hundred of them on you know Kauai and have an island with a hundred self driving cars? Perhaps. I don't know. I think I think they're going. For more of a fleet model, so you and yeah. I wouldn't own them, but perhaps we, yeah. uh, you know, summon them from our cell phone like an Uber. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so when we left, we think thirty thousand deaths a year. Ten years from now, going down to five, and I've got to pick the over the under. Mm. And I think I was going to pick that two thirds of deaths would go away, so ten thousand. That's pretty close then. You know, so I was pretty close to you. I think you know. I said two thirds. You're saying like five six. I think I'm going to go with the over, but not by much. So 10 years from now, whenever this date, whenever this airs, we are going to have $1,000 sushi dinner in a inflation-adjusted dollars, and it's going to be amazing to see. But I mean, we're both going to be winners because it's definitely the deaths are going to go down. So you're giving me 10 years to get the deaths under 5,000. That's a lot of time. 
I'm giving you tons of time. Listen, yeah. and you know what the thing is? Here's the thing about the bet. This is one of the great things about the bet. I can't influence the bet, but you can as an entrepreneur. It's kind of a great feeling, isn't it, that you're working on something where it's actually going to reduce death? Yeah, that was like one of the requirements for me, like starting a new company. And like you said, I've done this before. Was re reduce death? No, not reduce death, but <laughs> do, do something that was going to have an impact and, you know, um, a measurable impact, not necessarily like, you know, video games like we were doing at Twitch. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted something more direct. Well, yeah, and previously you did Justin TV, which became Twitch, I right, think. Right, right. Um, and I guess there's rumors that that was going to get bought for like a billion dollars from YouTube, but at the time of this taping, you have no comment on that subject. Yeah, pretty crazy. There's been no announcement, but pretty crazy. Uh, so congratulations if that happened. And if it didn't happen, hey, you know, um, I'm sure it's going to happen with this company. Um, so how did you get this company off the ground? Because you said before you're going up against Google, and that seems to me to be a Herculean task. I'm sure there are people who are entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who have ideas that are not as difficult to pull off, nor face the competition that you've chosen to face, mm -hmm. who are having a hard time raising money. You raised money. You got into Y Combinator for this? Yeah, I did Y Combinator. This did is the y second Combinator. time through. Second time through. So you're yeah. an alumni. That's incredible. We'll talk about that in a minute. But how, how do you? How did you raise money for this? Because <laughs> well, when you go to an investor and say, "I want to create cruise control for cars, autopilot," yeah, don't the first thing they say like, "Isn't Elon Musk and you know Larry Page working on that? Are you Elon Musk and Larry Page?" And well, where, do, where do I start? All these things. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, yeah, well, first of all, we're, this is the product we're building now. Obviously, like 10 years from now, I think to get down to 5,000 deaths or less, we're going to have to have a lot more technology. Mm -hmm. And we want to be positioned to be the company that's going to do that. And so when I was talking to investors, for example, uh, first of all, the, the space is sexy. People love the idea of self-driving cars. Ah, so they'll take the meeting. They'll take the meeting. And everyone knows it's, it's coming at some point. So the question is when and then mm. who's going to do it. Um, ah, so there is a sense of inevitability about this now. Right, right. So those two things work in your favor. It's like I want to... Do you get the sense that investors want to be associated with something this trendy or this virtuous? Yeah, I don't know. The, perhaps some people, but there's yeah. a lot of really smart investors who I think are less interested in that who mm. you know, still chose to put, put money in crews. Right. And so what was their – if they had an objection or a concern, what were the objections and concerns – and how did you overcome them? Well, there's plenty. And at the time, like, you the know, at yeah. the very beginning, I didn't have all these things solved. And that's kind of okay when talking to investors. It's like, you know, we have these problems. We're thinking about them. Here are maybe three ways we're probably going to address it. We don't have it solved yet. I think mm. that was better than trying to claim, you know, we had it all solved and Google hadn't. Right. So you're honest with them, like, hey, listen, <laughs> this yeah. is a huge Herculean task, but we're motivated. Right. And we have some ideas. Right. Um, so, yeah, and the other thing is, like, there's a lot of people who think this is going to be an enormous market. You know, Morgan Stanley put out some report saying the market's, like, $2 trillion. Wow. Um, How did they get to that number? It was something about, um, uh, what was it, the, the cost of, like, vehicle repairs and eliminating transportation. Ah. It's just, you know, they added up a bunch of different things. I think, like, insurance would go away, and they threw that in there. And, and a bunch, you know, they ended oh, up with this really big are, number. those are, that's the big loser. When you think <laughs> about who gets disintermediated, like, when you think about the ride-sharing services, yeah. it's like, oh, the people who own the medallions and the cab companies don't get to squeeze the drivers anymore because you don't need a dispatch company, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of, it's all software. In your case... You don't need insurance anymore, or if you do, you need a greatly reduced insurance because the number of accidents. Right, should I go mean, down. Yeah. Putting aside deaths, fender benders are mm -hmm. occurring, living in Los Angeles currently at the taping of this uh, episode. <laughs> the number of fender benders on the 405 freeway is just insanity. And probably most of those are because people are texting and trying of to stop and go traffic. Of course it yeah. is. Um, so if those goes away, yeah, insurance could, could take a hit. And you know, Warren Buffett made a comment about this recently because mm. I think he owns, is it Geico? He owns a bunch of stuff. Yeah, well, let's, he, well, let's assume he owns one of the major insurance yeah, companies. Yeah, and so he, he owns he, one of everything. He was asked about those, and, and he expressed concern, saying, like, I recognize wow. that, could, that could happen soon. That's um, interesting. So the person who is most, we would consider the most savvy investor, vocalized that fear. So he would yeah. be hedging his bet by investing in your company, has he? Uh, not yet. But you know, that's the it, guy you need to go to. You get your big mega you know, B round going. That's, that's a good idea. Can you put right? me in touch? 
I, I'm, I'm sure he listens to the show. So if, yeah. Um, you know. Well, no, no. But that's that's another issue I was going to yeah. bring up with with investors is if you believe in self-driving cars sort of as the future and and you agree that it's going to happen, there are not many places you can put your money right now. No, you can't. Google's, you can't even take that bet. If you yeah. invest in Google, you're investing mostly in a search business. That's an ad network. Yeah. Right. Right. You could invest in Tesla because Elon tweeted out a year ago mm -hmm. that he was going to do autopilot. Mm -hmm. So Elon Musk is in absolute sync with you. He believes. He, I think he made a comment like people aren't ready to be self-driven, mm -hmm. but they would love an autopilot because that makes them feel confident. You heard his comments, I'm sure, about this. What do yeah. you think of those comments? Uh, well, I, I agree with them completely. I think he's right on. And also, when he said, you know, we're building autonomous vehicles, he, he added the disclaimer that we're going to do, what, 90 or 95% of the driving. And I think what he's alluding to there is highway driving, mm -hmm. like working on people who commute a lot and that kind of yeah. thing. Um, and I think that, uh, of all people, he's one of the most likely to pull it off. Yeah. Um, so but, that's basically your competition. Well, kind of. But think yeah. about what I'm doing here. So I've designed this to work on uh, across different all makes cars. of car. There's yeah. 250 million cars in the U.S. And he's building right now, I think, 25,000 a year yeah. or something. Yeah, and he'll hit 250 and then 2.5, but he'll still be 1%. Yeah, yeah. That's so, the overall and, global and, market, yeah. You know, if you, if you ask like a, a scientist or an engineer working on this kind of technology and you ask them, like, what do they need to, to move faster? Hmm. The answer is data. And ah. so if we've got our, our system installed on lots of different cars and lots of different mm -hmm. markets and all that, um, you know, we might be able to, to develop more quickly because of that. All right, let's talk a little bit about other things the car does because uh -huh. we started to go down that like hardware path and that was kind of really interesting and I want to go back to that. So when we get back from the commercial break, I want to talk a little bit about the other technology um, that's going to make this possible mm -hmm. and then realistically, you know, how – Will this hit the market in terms of regulation and which markets will it be sure. legal in and all that kind of stuff? When we get back from these very important messages. Ah, yes. Envision, Envision app. I love Envision. I use this product literally multiple times a day. You can go check out envisionapp.com slash twist. What is it? It's a way to take mobile designs and put them on your phone. So when I'm designing inside.com or a launch product or even my startup company, 70 different investments, they will send me a link. I will open the link on my phone, and instead of my designer sending me a bunch of mock-ups in a PDF or on email or in a chat room, and all these notes getting lost, I can look at it on my phone and see beautifully and interactively how they're proposing the 2.0 version of Inside's going to work. And then if they're going to build another version of it, I can do it on my desktop. And I can click and put notes. I like this. I don't like this. And then those notes can get answered by other members of my team. Anyway, it takes all of these long, disgusting email chains about product and product design, and it puts them into a workflow that's brilliant. And you can see your product natively where it belongs, which is on the phone or on the iPad or on the desktop. It is gorgeous. Uh, design teams all over the world are using it. Uh, in fact, they have 300,000 designers using it, including the designers at Inside.com and Launch. Um, people at Airbnb, Evernote, MTV, Adobe, Box, and Zendesk are addicted to InVision. I know this. And they have a special offer for the listeners of this program, This Week in Startups. You can get the startup plan for free for 90 days. And that means unlimited screens, collaborators, real-time comments, sketch commenting, and more. It's a brilliant product. I use it constantly. And that's one of the great things about the partners I have who help me put on this show, This Week in Startups. I only take people for the program as partners if I use their product. And this is a product I literally have on my phone, like 50 icons of different versions of Inside.com that I've been commenting on. We are going at least 20% faster with our designs. I am not kidding. Look me in the eyes. 20% faster. Wouldn't you want your design department to go 20% faster? That is a competitive advantage. Don't get me started. Listen, envisionapp.com slash twist. Envisionapp.com slash twist. And I want you to go thank at Envision App right now on your Twitter handle and just tell them thank you for making a beautiful product and helping Jason get inside.com over the uh, finish line. And uh, hey, let's get back to this amazing program. Thank you, Envision. I love your product. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the program. Thanks to our partners for making amazing, amazing uh, moments like today's episode of This Week in Startup possible on the program today is Kyle Vote. Kyle Vote is with Cruise Automation, Inc., which you can go take a look at at getcruise.com, getcruise.com, getcruise.com. And you'll see the video of this madness. It's amazing. It actually works. How, how long have you been working on it to actually get to that working like in a parking lot version? Is that a year's work? Two years? No, three we, years? we did that in about four or five months. So in four insane. or five months, you yeah. got a prototype working in a parking lot. Yeah. 
Well, this is a, an airstrip, but yeah. An airstrip, that's yeah. what I mean. Like in a closed environment. Mm-hmm. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we, we took every shortcut possible to get from idea to, you know, working prototype. And, and like I said before, this area has, you know, been researched for 30 years. So there's, mm-hmm. we were standing on the shoulders of giants here for sure. Yeah. So the two cameras, you got some kind of sensors about motion. Mm-hmm. What else is in the hardware package? The cameras, the inertial sensor. We have a GPS and a radar. Okay. So now how do the GPS and the radar, I mean, we can take guesses on how they help with autopilot, as we're Mm -hmm. calling it. But what actually are they doing? Uh, So in the case of the radar, we're using it as a secondary source of uh, the location of the cars around you. So we can use Ah. the cameras to see the other vehicles, and we can also detect them with their radar reflections. Mm. These are big metal objects. Ah, so what level of accuracy does the camera have in spotting cars mm-hmm. on a percentage basis? Um, well, it depends on a number of factors. It's pretty high. I'd say, you know, we're in the... Or on a sunny day. Yeah, probably like in, in the upper 90%. Okay. And then we have, you know, sort of a backup source. This is the radar, which is, which is very reliable, but can have some false positives. So between ah. the two, we get pretty good data. Got it. So that's... And so the the... Radar might have 80 or 90 percent as well, but when you combine them and layer the data together, that's the magic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so the important thing though is not necessarily knowing where every single car is, but it's the ones directly in front of you and the one about to cut you off. Ah, so in the use case, is there somebody who's about to do something stupid and run into my vehicle? Mm-hmm. Now, if somebody was going to do, and this is, seems like a lot of accidents, you know, they change lanes and you're in the blind spot. Mm-hmm. I mean, it seems like half the accidents on the highway seem to be this scenario. I don't know statistically if it is or not. There's people running into the back of other people because they're texting or whatever. Right. And then there's people hitting the side, right? Yeah. So when people hit from the side like that, there's not much time to recover. So what's going to happen in an autopilot situation when the lasers and the camera show, oh, my God, I'm in my beautiful Audi here, and a Mack truck... 18-wheeler decides to change lanes. What actually happens? Oh, that, that's a real problem. As in changing lanes into you? Changing uh, lanes into you. The guy looks in the rearview mirror and is like, doesn't see the Alfa Romeo Fiat that's, you know, only 36 inches off the ground, you know? Yeah. And you're not, he's not going to clear your car, but he doesn't see you or she doesn't see you. And what happens in that situation? That's tough. Well, is that a situation where there's actually like an evasive maneuver you could take? Sure. Let's just say it's going to happen in a slow enough time period that, you know, it's like 1-1,000 to 1,000 impact. Okay. Um, so we're, we're still working on, on uh, our exact approach to this because it gets a little hairy when you, when you make trade-offs of like, do I, do I slam on the brakes or is it you know, better to hit the car in front of me to avoid an incident or something like that? Yeah, that's sort of what I'm getting at. Yeah. Or like, because what the human reaction would be is you see a huge truck, you don't even look to your right. You're going to the right. Yeah. Because better to go to the right and hit another car or another truck and have a 70% chance of surviving than, you know, whatever yeah, chance. But, but the, the are, are you really making that calculated decision in your head no. and like evaluating, uh, and, you know, like an expert driver who had all this hindsight data to make that call? No, I don't think it's so. Tough. It's more of a knee jerk reaction. A knee jerk reaction is I'm going to get the hell out of the way of that big truck. Yeah. All right, yeah. fair enough. Um, so w- I don't know exactly the answer to that particular scenario, okay. but what we are going to do is before we launch this, we're going to be very clear and transparent about you know the the steps we take if there is something like that imminent. Oh. For example, our system right now doesn't try to change lanes or, mm. uh, or or really navigate. It's more of just locks you in the same lane. Gotcha. Um, so really, what that means is the only evasive maneuvers we would take is essentially slamming on the brakes. Got it. So uh, hitting you, getting like you know hit by something from behind could you know we wouldn't really wouldn't really do a good job of that. If somebody was coming at you really f- – okay, so I get that. So in phase one, let's call it, mm-hmm. do, you have a f- do you have a name for the first phase? Is it phase well, this, one? This, or- this product is called the Cruise RP1. Okay, so in yeah. RP1, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm in my lane, and if the people in front of me stop, I'm going to stop in time. Mm-hmm. But if somebody comes from the left or the right or behind, I'm not going – to try to make an evasive maneuver, and if the person in front of me stops, dead stops, and I don't have enough time because I was too close or whatever, I'm not going to have the time to go around them. It's the, right. the autopilot's not going to be like, oh, I'm going to just go in the lane around them. Right. That would be another version or two versions out, you think? Yeah, and that, that starts to get, to get into um, NHTSA, the, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I think that's what it stands for. Yeah. They're like levels of safety. And as you move up uh, into more advanced autonomous behaviors, different regulatory issues kick in. Ah. Uh, so we can talk about that too. Yeah. So the National Highway Safety Board. It's the NHTSA, and- the good TSA. I like that. Oh, one. okay. Yeah. The NHTSA. Okay. So anyway, this government body is actually so on it that they have 
decided the levels of autonomy in driving? Yeah. That so, makes me feel good about government. Well, they, they've defined what they are. They haven't regulated it at all, okay. but they're, they're thinking about it, which is important. Right. So take me yeah. through some of the definitions they came up with. Do you agree with them or what? Yeah. Um, well, we're, we're in uh, level two right now, which okay. is where you take one or more, um, dri- control one more one or more types of driving. So in this case, like acceleration with mm-hmm. adaptive cruise control and steering with sort of lane centering. Got it. Um, and you're doing it in, in most situations, but in dynamic driving situations, you may ask the driver to take over. Ah, so if something becomes dynamic, somebody's slamming on brakes, somebody's going across the highway at a yeah, or, or bad like bad weather that you suddenly oh, hit fog. or something like that. Yeah, is fog the big enemy? Um, what's fog the big is enemy? one of the enemies. Yeah, yeah. what's the? Well, I mean, what just totally borks the radar and the cameras to the point at which you're like, you know what? Yeah, no autopilot for you. Well, a lot of those things right now. So we're not we're not optimizing for all weather. We're mm. optimizing for getting you know sort of. This simple, safe thing to market as quickly as possible with mm. with certain caveats, and one of those will be that as soon as the sensors start detecting that the data coming in doesn't look right, mm. uh, it initiates a handoff and asks you to take over. So yeah. if you start if it starts raining suddenly, or you drive into a fog patch or something like that, got it. Um, we're not we're not going to try to do that. But it will work at night or not? Is it going to be not, a daytime only? Not yet. It doesn't. The prototype doesn't currently. I don't know if the final product is going to or ah, not. Because I was about to say nighttime is one where I would be like, I don't know, sure if at night I want yeah. to, but that may not make sense because at night. The computer might be actually more effective than a human because at night you might be tired mm-hmm. and our eyes are not particularly well designed for nighttime use. Right. And there's some cameras that have extremely high sensitivity that are really good at seeing at night. Precisely. Mm-hmm. And so nighttime might be the the optimal time for get that's, cruise. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, and so the next level would be actually making these kind of movements around vehicles. Is that right? Or... Um, evasive maneuvers? Or? Yeah, you know, part of what we're doing here is, is uh, you know, taking the first steps. Our, our pilot program is going to be 50 units. You know, mm. they're, they're going to, I hate to use the word pilot because they're going to be safety tested and, and thoroughly examined by third parties before we put them out there. First deployment. Yeah, the first deployment. Um, and that's mostly for us to learn about, you know, how, how people are going to use this technology. What are the things they want? Mm. Is it driving at night? Do they really want lane, cha- lane changing and handling exits and merging? What is it? So we want to learn that before, like, really deciding our product roadmap. What are the rules right now for autopilot? Are you allowed to do this right now? When you come out with this product next year, Um, what cities and states will allow somebody to hit the autopilot button? And then if I hit the autopilot button, what am I allowed to do in the front seat? I guess it's sort of two questions, right? Am I allowed to start texting? Am I allowed to be distracted? Or is it just not defined? Well, the answer to that um, depends on where you're talking about. So Mm. uh, right now, each state, every state in the United States has their own vehicle code. Mm. And they all have different definitions of what an operator or a driver or a controller of the vehicle is. Hmm. And so if you're trying to look at those through the ends of an auto- uh, the lens of an autonomous vehicle, um, you get come to all sorts of different conclusions depending on the state. Hmm. However, um, about four or five states have made, you know, started to make regulations that would allow either the testing or operation of autonomous vehicles, California being one of those, which is great. It wasn't it also Nevada was like pretty pro this. I think they were the first. Yeah, yeah. So their, their regulations ended up slightly different. Hmm. Um, I think California is still one of the more f- friendly states for this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, in Las Vegas, they're going to do anything, obviously, right? <laughs> These guys in Nevada don't care. I mean, they're just like, yeah, guns, whatever, prostitution, gambling, let's <laughs> they go. Want, they want to get the self-driving cars. Yeah, I mean, they, the they need yeah. self-driving cars to get people to casinos and to gun ranges and brothels and everything. Maybe it's like, it's a free-for-all out there. I, I don't know if that's their motivation, but, you know. No, I'm joking. I, I, I kid, cool. I kid. But California is the most aggressive? Or who's the most aggressive? Uh, I wouldn't say most, New Hampshire? Ag- most aggressive, but uh, most, maybe most... Um, the, innovative. I would say California is because they've actually had a series of public hearings where they invite mm. um, the car the car makers to show up. Google yeah. is there, and even like you know startup companies are invited to have a seat at the table and mm. uh, say, "Here's the things you might not have thought about when you're making this regulation." Um, wow. You know these things matter. Where which did they is do great. this? Like in a conference room or uh, in in, in uh, Sacramento at the the DMV headquarters? So you did you go to that? I haven't been to. Oh, okay. No, no. So like. Sergey Brin's going to the DMV in Sacramento, taking a number, and then sitting with the legislator to talk about autonomous cars. Not quite. Google yeah. Google hired uh, the the former, I think he's the director of of the NHTSA to be their their oh, rep. rep at that thing. Oh, yeah, he's right. the director. Well, that's of he's a great guy, Ron Ron Medford. But yeah, so he's is the sense that the government governments and agencies are pro this. Because usually we hear the governments are like, oh, we have to stop Airbnb. Oh, we have to stop, you know, Lyft or Sidecar mm-hmm. or Uber. We have to stop them. We have to stop them. It seems like in this area, 
they're pro. Well, they're, they're uh, cautiously optimistic because on one hand, they want the potential to save lives and reduce accidents, which is you know, obviously important. Uh, on the other hand, they're cautious about putting something on the road that's not quite there yet and mm. potentially causing more harm than good. Huh. And so they're, they're trying to, to strike that balance and also strike the balance between regulation that's too soon and too aggressive uh, or too lax and too late. So as an entrepreneur and as a citizen of the fine state of California, <laughs> You think they're doing a good job, a great job, an awesome job? I, I think they're doing a great job, actually. Yeah. Um, I like that they're uh, listening to people, mm. and they're also being proactive in doing something rather than just you know, sort of not caring or, or not thinking like this is going to happen soon. Now, the lane changing, there's some Volvos that tell you, correct me if I'm wrong, if you've drifted, I've seen commercials and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So people know if you've drifted, people have the automatic... But is that as far as it goes right now in the market today? There's um, a, a couple systems, like a high-end Mercedes mm. has a system where it will do lane keeping as long as you're like in a straight line and you have your hands on the wheel. Ah, it knows if your hands are on the wheel? Yeah. So it, it, if you take your hands it. off the wheel, it, after 15 seconds, it shuts off, which is Interesting. you know not really the experience you want. No. It's like I put it on autopilot. And then my hands have to be on the wheel. Isn't mm -hmm. the whole idea that I could do something else? You know, I, I agree. Well, yeah. I don't know. So doing something else is yeah. Let's get to that question, beyond, right? Yeah. yeah. So when this becomes in the market, in the pilot, let's say you get this out in the second quarter of 2015, mm -hmm. what is going to be the marching orders for the pilot who presses the autopilot button? Well, this is this is where the first generation of this technology. So it's not quite to the point where you can take a nap or fall asleep okay. uh, or pull out your laptop. You still have to be paying attention to the road. Okay. Uh, and in California, it is still illegal to text when you're uh, in the driver's seat of the right. vehicle. So you, you, you can't be doing that. So you can't be distracted, but you're not driving. Right. So that's sort of purgatory. <laughs> You're, you have to sit there and stare at the road and not drive. It's it's uh it's going to be yeah, a weird transition. It is it is, but you know I think uh, it's a little bit of a comfort and convenience thing. Sure. If you, if you're in stop and go traffic, I personally hate it. I'm always like leaning over the steering wheel, mm. just fuming at the guy in front of me. And so when you when you're just sitting there, you're a little bit more detached from from sort of the perils of driving and the annoyances there. Yeah. So it's going to be, in all honesty an awkward first year or something of these systems. It's gonna be cool, but it's not gonna be that you can check your email or pay partial attention. Yeah, if you think about, um, and the reason for this, there, there's several reasons for that. Um, the second you tell someone they can pull out a laptop or, or take a nap or something. Yeah, it's pretty binary. Then what happens is if you have to tell the user to take control of the vehicle than the driver, there's a much longer delay between you know when you give them the alert and when they actually have situational awareness. Ah. Um, and so basically, you need to get the technology to the point where it can actually drive completely by itself, you know, in all circumstances for whatever that time is, 5, 10, 15 seconds. Mm. Um, and doing that um, reliably means all sorts of levels of redundancy and mm. backup systems and safety that, that aren't in these first generation of products. Got it. They, so basically, you need to have like double, you basically have to have double the amount of computers, cameras, yeah. et cetera. It's more like an aircraft autopilot than a, than yeah. a cruise control at that point. And will the government be looking at your actual product and looking at how you wire it and circuit it and have those sort of features, or are they just going to want to see it be tested? Because um, they don't have the people who are qualified to open up a box and go through it, do they? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's the intent. Not at the time, right? Yeah. Uh, right now, so for California's regulations, which are still a moving target, I don't know if we're going to end up at <laughs> that point, but no one has tried to put one of these vehicles on the road yet, that yeah. level of autonomy. Um, You'll be the first. Well, if we get there, so that's that's you know a ways down the road. Yeah. Um, but but it's right, looking like you'll be the first. I hope so. Is yeah. there somebody else who you think is going to get there before you or close? Um, there's always a chance one of the automakers could pop up and and really rush this technology to market. Ah. Um, who's and then there's startups. The, Other startups, maybe I don't yeah. know about yet. Who are, who's which automaker is the most savvy and far along with this? So I guess every single automaker has like a research vehicle almost. Mm. There's probably like 20 different groups working on this. Hmm. Um, the most impressive that I've seen so far is Mercedes, um, mm. who have a vehicle that only has cameras and has driven like 100 miles across Germany um, with only like one or two situations where the driver had to take control.
Oh, so they actually let them do it in Germany and uh, with a lead well, car that was a, that was sort of a, I think they had a special yeah permit. special permit to yeah. just try it or whatever. Yeah. Ah, so Mercedes could have something interesting uh, as well soon. Yeah, and they're and they're partnering with Nokia, who believe it or not uh, acquired Navtech and is now this like mapping behemoth mm. uh, who's competing with Google in some ways. Mm. And so Google and Nokia are really the only companies that have the mapping data you need for the kind of stuff that the Mercedes did. Ah. Uh, but you're not going to rely on the maps as much, or are you going to just have to license from those partners? Do you think? Um, that's that's still an open question. Right uh, now, we don't rely heavily on maps because mm-hmm. we're looking at the landmarkers. Mm-hmm. But if you want to do really advanced driving, you kind of need a map. Let me ask you a stupid question. Why is this all in the car? Which is to say, shouldn't we put things in the road that are like absolutely dead si- simple, redundant, and make it super clear to the car where it should be? Mm-hmm. Because we're basically mapping the world with, on the fly. But the world doesn't need to be mapped on the fly. If you drill the hole into the road, in the lanes, which they already do to put in the reflectors, mm-hmm. and put something there. I don't know exactly what. But something that could be either easily read by, by computers or easier or was a beacon-like technology. I'm not picking the technology, mm-hmm. Wi-Fi, beacon, Bluetooth, whatever. Wouldn't that just make this phenomenal? And phenomenally safe? You're onto something there. I mean, the California actually did this in the 80s, believe it or not. They did? Or maybe early 90s. It was called the, the PATH program, and they put magnets in the road, like every 10 feet or something, on, uh, I think, a mile-long stretch of highway as an experiment. And magnets are exactly what you're talking about. You know, they yeah. work in most we- you know, all weather conditions, and they're kind of a beacon to tell you where the road is. Ah. Um, but I think the problem with any solution like that is it has to be rolled out in infrastructure nationwide. And who knows who's going to bear the cost of that well, in local jurisdictions. You do have places like California or yeah. Silicon Valley where transportation is at a standstill, literally. Mm-hmm. And things like the 40510 exchange or here the 101 are major uh, impediments to commerce and life. Mm-hmm. And you have the will in the case of the 405 expansion, the Sepulveda expansion, which just got completed near my home in, in Brentwood and between Brentwood and Bel Air, they basically cut a mountain. <laughs> they literally went and sliced a piece of the mountain up when you saw to see the project up close. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar project. Yeah. Like the will is there. So to just even do it on that stretch of road and let people daisy chain the cars, like the will would be there for that. What, what would the technology be? Do you uh, know? I mean, I love that. I, yeah. So there's there's a lot of research going into V to I and uh, V to V communication, which is like short range radio. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of been one of the, the selected technologies for this kind of thing. And the idea is that in the future, you know, the road will talk to you, the street signs will talk to you, or your car, that is, and provide all this information. But from my perspective, like, you know, I don't know how long that's going to take. Maybe it's 10 years before it's rolled out nationwide. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, 30,000 people are dying a year. So right. if we can do that sooner, it's absolutely worth it. Right. Now, what would the signs tell the cars? I mean, it's sort of like an interesting science fiction-like moment. The signs or the road starts telling the car. Give me some scenarios in which the car would get some amazing piece of information from the road or the sign. Yeah, so I guess there's two interesting examples for for V to V communication, like your car talking to another car. Uh-huh. If there's an accident around a bend up ahead and it hasn't Ooh. traffic hasn't slowed down or something like that, okay. you can basically see around corners, you know, because wow, that that's car some can Batman level yeah. shit, man. Yeah, so that's so, that's one one example. Hold on a second, we got to sit on that example for a second. So I'm coming around the bend. Mm-hmm. It's a blind turn or whatever, or it's just a turn. Two cars have hit each other. The vehicle to vehicle communication no. That, that, that system knows there's been a collision. Right. One of those cars is going to radio it out or the car right behind So them. those two cars are like, we've been in a crash mm-hmm. at this exact location. Tell the cars right behind us and for X number of feet behind them that there is an obstacle at in lanes two and three. Right. So they, so in this case, it'd probably just slow down and start braking before you get there. Wow. Yeah. So your car would start braking and you'd say, I wonder why we're braking. There must be an accident ahead. Mm-hmm. And literally, you might be the first person over the hill and not slam into it. And so the concept of a pileup, even in fog, would go away. Yeah, it could. And so that's there's still a debate out whether this kind of technology is going to be the way it works or whether each vehicle is just going to be connected to the cloud and the cloud will sort of watch over and see like, oh, there's cars piled up here, like, you know, slow down before you get there. Yeah, that is phenomenal. It's sort of like what they have this technology already in planes. Yeah. When planes get too close to each other, 
there's some technology. We can look it up, Jackie, and you can tell me maybe on the uh, mo- the courtesy monitor here, and I'll we'll cut this part out, and it'll seem like I'm really smart. But um, yeah, tell me the name of that technology, Jackie. But there's a technology in planes that beacons, and it tells you because I was in a plane, I was in a small prop plane when it happened. Mm-hmm. We were in a plane doing like a small flight in like a, a cheetah, like a four seat plane. Yeah, and we heard. Eh, 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 eh. And the guy's like, the guy just immediately starts looking left and right. And there was a plane coming in from like literally our blind spot on wow. the left. And he just went, and he turned the plane sideways. And I don't know if you've ever been in a plane that gets turned completely horizontal. No, vertical. He turned the wings vertical to the earth. Wow. When you do that in a plane, you know what happens? It drops. <laughs> it just immediately goes. And we just dropped like 500 feet in a second. And then he just pulled it right back up, boom. And I was like, what the hell? I was like, yeah, we have these beacons. And the beacon makes this noise if you're too close. That's cool. Well, that's basically what this, this would so be. So if yeah. somebody was going to run a red light, if we were coming up, just even a, another simple example, we're both mm-hmm. coming to a light. The light's broken for some reason or some idiot's going to run the red light. I would know as I'm approaching that there's somebody approaching at a rate of speed that's greater than the ability to stop at the intersection. Sure. Yeah, and it's, impo- it's like impossible for them to stop. You know. So yeah, like they're go. going 40 yeah. miles an hour, and they've got seven feet to go before the intersection. You're going 30 miles an hour, and you're going to be in the intersection in one second. Mm-hmm. You would actually have time for both of you to have the brakes slammed. That's the idea. Those. That's that's the goal they, of this kind of technology. Do you know what they call that? Because I've heard about this before. Is, aren't they going to start putting that in cars soon? Yeah. This, I mean, I, I think I think even Obama just said something about it like last week. Or did something. he really? Yeah. Um, so cars are going to become more aware at some point. Yeah, but the problem is uh, a, a problem with technologies like that, especially when you're integrating it into new vehicles. And this is why I'm doing the aftermarket yeah. stuff. Is uh, you know, typically it takes about 20 years for a new technology to reach sort of critical mass in yeah. the, in the fleet of cars in the U.S. Because people don't buy a new car every year; they hold on to it, and cars these days are are lasting longer and longer. So that cycle is getting even even more drawn out. Yeah, we don't have an upgrade cycle for cars. I mean, that's one of the great things of the Model S from Tesla is when you get in the car every couple of weeks. It's new software. New something. software. Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, Google Maps is better. It's yeah. got live traffic data. You're like, yeah. oh, really? Genius. Or they've got some better algorithm for the batteries. Mm-hmm. But you're right, because how many times do we get in a car and you're like, can I connect to your stereo with Bluetooth? And it's like, oh, yeah, I got this car before Bluetooth seven years right, ago, right? right? Now it's like you can... You can't get a car without Bluetooth connectivity, probably. Maybe so even in 20 years, when yeah. this V to V technology is widespread, it's going to feel like dinosaur technology. You know, it's really yeah. They would have to go to outdated. all the old cars and say you have to get this upgraded. Yeah, which I don't think there's much historical precedent because even when airbags came out or yeah, like no, analog no. brakes, it's not like they made every single car, you know, as a requirement that you would too much of an economic added. burden. Right? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Now, what about this like um, cars traveling in packs and the impact that would have on HOV lanes. Like mm-hmm. we hear, we keep hearing about this. You keep seeing videos, at t videos from the 90s, you will videos, if yeah. you remember those. Like everybody's been talking about this. It's still not here. Is your technology, how close does your technology come to allowing that? Um, well, that's difficult. It takes, again, it takes a critical mass of vehicles like on the same highway at the same time to really make that work. Yeah, but let's assume... Um, magically half the cars had it and the left hand lane was only for you know uh daisy chained vehicles mm-hmm. you know vehicles traveling in a caravan what would that look like and how would that impact stuff well i'd rather just have it be autonomous vehicles get the left lane but if it's if yes. it's these vehicle platoons yeah um i guess there's actually a lot of studies going on on that because it's an attractive idea in theory mm. that you could save fuel efficiency because they're going closer together and oh because uh, one is breaking the wind yeah they're drafting basically. they're drafting yeah. like like uh at the uh like race cars or well, yeah, swimmers. Like race cars or, or, yeah, race cars, swimmers, or bicyclists. Uh-huh. Um, so what impact would it have? You save gas, great. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I say I'm not not fully convinced that's that's going to happen uh, right away because there, you know, there are complications involving like entering and exiting these platooning ah, things that, yeah. that could actually n- you know negate the overall effect. Right, you'd have to wait and then get into the end of the chain. Yeah, or then these guys have to merge over. They're going at high speed and they have to merge into slow moving traffic that's driven by humans. It you know, it might have oh, to wow, slow the whole yeah. thing down. Kind of a disaster. Yeah, so it's tricky. Right. Tricky to get right. So you went through Y Combinator a second time with this product. Yeah, yeah, well jumping back to that. Yeah, sure. I want to jump back to that for a second with the Y Combinator thing. Why did you do that? I mean, you're the founder of a company, uh, Justin T V and uh, the subsequent spinoff, um, Twitch, Twitch, yeah. that is arguably valued at high hundreds of millions or billion, low billions of dollars, mm-hmm. uh, depending on who you talk to. The, you didn't have to go back to Y Combinator, and to give them six percent for 120 grand sounds like you have 120 grand and you 
went back. Why would you do that? Well, that wasn't quite the, the, the deal we had with them. Oh, you get but... a different deal if you're blown out super founder. Yeah, I've heard that. Yes. <laughs> um, you can uh, negotiate a better term, of course. Yeah. They, they don't really negotiate, but um, yeah, but that, that didn't really matter to me because the interesting thing about Y Combinator is, first of all, it provides this intense environment for three months. And mm. even though I'm, I consider myself self-motivated, yeah. there's something else about being in a room with 80 other companies who are all trying to basically one up each other and show the most progress week to week. Huh. So that's just a good environment. Um, secondly, uh, demo day at Y Combinator is still a pretty amazing thing. There's nothing like it mm. that I'm aware of where you get, you know, 400 investors in a room and out of those 80 companies, maybe there's like 10 companies who are really attractive to investors because they have the most progress. And it just creates this insane mismatch of supply and demand, yeah. uh, which which helps you raise money on better terms. Yeah, the terms have been incredible. Um, yeah, and and also so because of that, you're you're raising money on better terms. That sort of negates the equity cost of doing what. Right, 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 place. right. So that actually makes sense. Yeah. Um, but for somebody who knows as much as you do now, ten years into your entrepreneurial career. Does going to the dinners or like hearing speakers like your would be that you would be the speaker. So you <laughs> no, going and hearing the other speakers is kind of like, you know. There, there are still some excellent speakers. That yeah. YC pulls in some Even for people. you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm definitely not an expert, but, you know, there's some good people there. Yeah, of and, course. Uh, no, it's great people who come. I'm just wondering. It, admittedly, I did not go to all the dinners because oh, we're okay. based in San Francisco, and I was uh -huh. sort of weighing the cost of the, the three hours down and back. Yeah. yeah. No autonomous cars going down there yet. Uh, not yet. So has the demo day happened yet at the taping of this episode or no? Yeah, the demo day. Uh, so I was in the, I guess it's winter 14. Oh, uh, yeah. Batch, so that I missed was the demo day. I was going to March, go I think. Yeah. yeah. So what was the reaction when you showed it? Um, it was pretty interesting. The, the, so I, when I did Y Combinator the first time, it was like a half an hour presentation for a company. And you like yeah. walk through your website and show off all the features. Yeah. But now it's like two and a half minutes rapid fire. And you're trying to basically just say something provocative that gets everyone's attention so they'll come talk to you afterwards. So basically it's just lightning round. You're not really – so that kind of sucks in a way. But I guess it's a – there's 80 companies or 60 companies. How many people were in your class? I think there uh, there were, I, I can't remember, maybe high 60s or 70 yeah. or something. Yeah. And they all go in the same day. Uh, yeah. It's a long day. That's crazy. And it's, it's also for back to back. One day is for the YC alumni and the yes. second day is for the uh, investors. So the alumni come and they give you feedback on your presentation and they may invest, I guess. Yeah. YC has been around long enough that a lot of the alumni have sure. a lot of cash. So yeah. yeah. Drew from Dropbox is sure. like, yeah, I'll take, I'll sure. take the top 10. Let's I'll go. I'll take them all. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Um, well, that's amazing. And so you raised a lot of money or a little bit of money? How, how did the raise go? And then did you, how much did you close? Or did some big VC involved? Did uh, you announce it? We haven't made any announcements around okay. it. Okay. Um, but, you know, we have we have some cash to keep going for a while. Did you raise from a big VC firm or you just go all angels? This is sort of um, what I'm getting at. There's no VC firm at this point. Oh. Huh. Yeah. So what was, tell me through that decision. Because a lot of people are doing that now, right? They're just like, I don't need a big VC firm right now. I'm going to just do Power Angels because why? Um. Well, I think there's a little bit of, of this desire to maintain control, especially mm -hmm. a lot where a lot of the end product design or specs or even the direction of the company could change dramatically. Mm. Um, if you if you sell a, a VC, for example, on one idea and you have to do a significant pivot, maybe they'll lose interest or, or ah. try to fight you on that or something. So I wanted to have a little more independence early on. Right. Because they're like, well, we will, we made a three, four million dollar bet on that. On this thing. Now you're doing that. Uh, now you're doing that and, thing. Like, I got to go back to my partners and right. explain this. And, and after going through Justin TV, which pivoted like three or four times, I realize that you know that's kind of important to have that option what was that like because i remember the early days of justin tv and mm -hmm. i guess Ustream was a big one that yeah, yeah, yeah and it was i mean that was the wild west i mean it you was. guys had like major bandwidth costs at the time we did. i believe it was it was insustain unsustainable like advertising revenue versus bandwidth cost yeah, nobody wanted out. to advertise on it at the start yeah, yeah the bandwidth was ridiculous and then you had this massive like russian scammers putting the world cup and hbo stuff online so you had this like whack-a-mole i remember at justin we had some problems yeah with copyright stuff not your own fault but it's an open platform so how close did justin come to in all honesty just not making it um, do you think there were several points where we were what was the closest the, what was the closest I think it was at a point where we were probably spending around um, like seven hundred thousand dollars a month and we maybe had two hundred thousand dollars in revenue and cash in the bank was down to like around a million bucks so you got like weeks left yeah and so like one thing we did to sort of like be transparent to the team is every week at our team meetings we would post um, like weeks of runway left 
So everyone knew, like, what yeah. When you're getting was. down to making it weeks as opposed to months of runway, yeah, that's going to scare the yeah out so, of your team. So we, you know, there's a trade off between transparency and sort of like you know taking that burden on yourself and not scaring everyone else on the team, right? Um, but we we pulled through with some financing at the last minute and kept it going. And then it what was around. that like though the the day? Take me back to that day where you had to go tell the team there was six weeks left. Um, I don't, Do you remember where it was and, and what the reaction was? Was did people just gasp or what what happened? What I don't like? I don't think we ever got that far. I Eight, think it I think that ten. number just started disappearing from the weekly meetings after after oh, it really? got really dire. Yeah. Um uh and, but yeah, there was definitely like a, a something in the air of like, well, was, you know, is, is this thing about to die? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, and that was one time. The other time, which is really early on, we had just raised when the company first started. We took fifty thousand dollars from Paul Graham um, to to do Justin TV, and we had spent two thirds of that, or maybe almost all of it. Paul Graham, the founder of White Combinator. Right. He invested personally. He invested personally. Wow. I, I believe. Yeah. Um, this was after Justin had done White Combinator once before that yeah. even. Um, but we we launched and we had spent most of our money and we uh, had some traffic because we were on TechCrunch, which is a huge driver of traffic. Yeah. Um, for Especially back then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, no, Hacker News and Product Hunt and yeah, I other think, things hadn't read it. <laughs> now those things drive more. They do. Yeah. I think we had maybe fifteen thousand dollars in the bank, and we got our first bandwidth bill, and it was thirty thousand dollars. Wow. So that was in another bad Oops. situation. Yeah. And what do you do? You call and you just cry mercy and beg the. You push it off a few months. You know. Really. And uh, yeah. That's so crazy. That that was a rough. The time provider well. didn't threaten to turn you off. Uh, I don't think that accounting and, and the technical department were like talking that well. So oh wow, <laughs> so it wasn't even people didn't even know how close you right. were to having the bandwidth turned off right. because of not paying the huge bill. And that would have been probably, doing live video delivery on the internet in 2007 was expensive. It was crazy. Yeah, you guys were nuts. Yeah, <laughs> it was like the more people who used your product and the more popular it got, the the closer to death you got. Yeah, it wasn't really until video ads and online video became a big thing that yeah. it started to turn around. Yeah, and then it was like, oh, there might be something. Tell me about that pivot to to Twitch. Um, well, we we uh, had sort of plateaued with Justin TV, and we had this whack a mole problem you were talking about with people um, posting bad content on our site. Yeah, and so uh, the four founders we went into a room and said like, okay, what are we doing here? Yeah. Um, and we had sort of two factions here. I guess we had Emmett, who is now the CEO of Twitch. He's like, yeah. the video game stuff on our site is awesome and people love it and it's growing on its own and we haven't yeah. even tried to support it. Yeah, and, and then, the IP around it, the intellectual property issues around it, the video game companies, it turns out, love, love right. that you're doing this and getting more people to buy the game because if you're watching Minecraft or you're watching yeah. Team Fortress, you're going to go buy it. It took a year or two for them to realize that. They were a little concerned yeah. at first. But yeah, some of them, like yeah. Take Two or like yeah. a couple of these people like were yeah. persnickety. And then, and then the other faction in the room was Michael and, and Justin, who thought, well, mostly Michael, who thought mobile was, was blown. Ah, mobile live go. video was going to be huge. Yeah. And so they, they sort of like, that we had two Skunk Works <laughs> groups. One was working on Social Cam, which is our yeah. basically Instagram for video. Yeah. And the other group um, was, was working on doubling down on video games. Hmm. Um, and then the, the mobile team spun out Social Cam as a separate product and then hmm. was la later acquired by Autodesk. Yeah. Um, and then Twitch sort of swallowed Justin TV um, yeah. as, as its traffic on just the gaming vertical eclipsed the rest of the site. It was a brilliant pivot to the video games and for so many reasons. But really, like, you, if you looked on YouTube at the time with Machinima and other people, like... Mm -hmm. Even at Mahalo, we had 20 people playing video games and putting up videos. The number yeah. of people who watched these videos, the walkthroughs, the gameplay, it was extraordinary. And interestingly enough, years later, YouTube then shut down all the video game stuff. The video people who were doing the video game videos complained, and all the publishers were like, please, YouTube, do not shut off the video game stuff. And they reversed it. I don't know if you followed all that. Yeah. But they literally... YouTube reversed their decision to take down the video game stuff because the publishers actually wanted it out there. Yeah. I mean, it's great. It's free advertising. You know? Free advertising, although some people might think. So you, you got a dozen people working on this now? The, 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 uh, the, we have the uh, cruise six stuff? now. Yeah, S Only six? Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Who are these people? These like <laughs> PhDs from MIT or these software hackers? Or mostly, they... yeah. The, so is I it went literally? To, yeah. I went to MIT, and yeah. so my, my team is mostly MIT people who have you know been working at robotics companies for the last seven years while I was off doing Twitch. Yeah, um. so you're like, yeah, I was making video games stream to from an Xbox to your desktop, but now I'd like to save 25,000 lives a year and have cars drive themselves. Is, is that that weird? <laughs> it's, not, it's not actually, you know what? I mean, if you look at somebody like Elon, you know, he 
did his first company, Zip2. It was like a publishing CMS. Yeah, and online payments to rocket ships. And then ships. he did yeah. like a payment, like a banking financial services company. And then he was like, yeah, let's do electric cars and colonize Mars. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it is that kind of a natural progression, I think, that you get bored building websites. Hmm. At a certain sense. I mean, didn't yeah. you get bored at a certain sense with Justin TV? Like, oh, God, the website. Um, well, I had worked on this. This is basically streaming live video for like seven years. So, so I was you a little tired of that. Yeah, tired of it. But on, just in terms of ambition, though, didn't you also – or did you also feel at a certain point like, God, what I'm doing is not meaningless but not meaningful enough um, as an entrepreneur? Because you, you are looking at the Google X project and you're yeah. looking at Elon Musk and other people doing – pretty epic shit now. Yeah. Well, even Uber is ep epic in its own way because it's out in the real world or Airbnb is epic in its own way because it's in the real world. Yeah. It feels like that's the trend in entrepreneurship is people are getting tired of building websites. Well, I I, I think it's it's amazing if you can find a way to, to do both, like either build a website or, or build a technology company that also has a huge impact and can help people. Yeah. I think it's hard to find those things. Um, yeah. But the nice thing is when you do, everyone's on the same page. You don't have to lure people into the office with perks and snacks because they're, they're uh, there because they care. It's, it's a mission-driven company. You know, you want to save lives. Yeah. It's not a mission-driven company in a corny, I read Tony Shea's book, <laughs> and I'm trying to make my enterprise software company for lawyers mission driven well that's that's a mission too i guess it's like you know the thing it's a that, boring mission a different kind the one the, the kind that makes you want to get up in the morning and go to work right i mean i think that's one of the very fascinating things going on right now in our industry is that there are people doing projects that are so meaningful that people who are just doing an enterprise software company or just the next app it, it kind of is hard to recruit you have to actually aspire to do something greater hmm. yeah I, I agree with that um did you see that in why did you see that in Y combinator like companies that, that were doing more impactful things. Yeah, like just in the real world, bigger, impactful things from when you went there the first time? Um, yes, definitely. I think so. Yeah. Uh, th there's, it's interesting, though, because some people are, are happy just going through the motions of starting a successful business and pulling that off. That's, mm -hmm. that's a really challenging thing and really satisfying. Yeah, totally. um, so I think you can do that and be happy and feel good about yourself Absolutely. without necessarily changing the world in terms yeah. of you know eliminating hunger or, or poverty. Yeah, it's just, uh, it is very interesting what you're saying, that your team comes to work every day stoked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, it helps that self-driving car technology is just really cool if you're an engineer. Yeah, I mean, um, you, but there's you also, have to yeah. kick people out of the office, I bet, at night. Like, please <laughs> go home and sleep so that tomorrow you can be productive. Pretty much, yeah. So next year, we might be able to buy this and put it on our cars. Yeah, that's the goal. What will it cost? $10,000. Okay, so, so it's, it's not, not cheap. No, but you know, I, I kind of think of it the same way. The first laptops and cell phones were pretty expensive. Yeah, and the Roadster was $140,000, sure. and sure. it has, like, literally it's 10% of the driving experience of the Model S, which mm -hmm. is half the price. Right. You know, and the next one will be half the price as well. So you expect to get 50 or 100 people to put this in? Will it work on a Tesla Model S? Not or yet. too complicated? <laughs> Uh, well, so we, we um, install our own actuators to control your steering, gas, and brake. Mm -hmm. They're all tucked away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can work on any car. Um, we just have to, you know, slightly modify it to, to be customized for a specific model. So you're going after the Audis first? Yeah. Why? Why did you pick that instead of the Tesla Model S? Because the Tesla Model S owners are, like, massive early adopters. Yeah. And they um, use the Mercedes drive the Mercedes steering column, so it should be accessible, right? Yeah, so there's a couple things going on there. Uh, first of all, we, we did a survey and talked to a bunch of people we ah. thought would be potential customers, and they either currently own Audis or would want to own an Audi. Huh. And in general, I think Audi um, owners are like technology-centric, and they, they want yeah, to sure their stuff in the car. Um, and it's a sexy brand. Tesla, at first, I was a little worried about you know stepping on Elon Musk's toes. I didn't know what he had going sure. on. And I didn't want like a cease and desist saying, you know, right. get out of our cars or something like that. That. Right, they could void the warranty. Well, the, or, war warranties are kind of protected in a way, so that that's good at least. Yeah. Oh, are they? Yeah. Yeah. Because when you do aftermarket stuff, like start putting in things. Well, if you if you put in an aftermarket stereo system and then your brakes fail, they can't deny ah, warranty coverage for that. They have to it. prove a relationship. Oh, they do have to prove a relationship, right? Yeah. And so, is Audi stoked to have you doing this or not, or do they uh, even know you? Audi is an enormous company. I, I, I yeah, they're not. You're not a, even on their radar. We're a blip on the radar. Yeah. Interesting. Well, listen, I think this is going to be a tremendous success, and I'm like really hopeful that you guys make it. Um, our ten-year bet's going to be epic to see, <laughs> because I'm going to put that even on my if, calendar. I tell you, this is the great thing. If I lose, and I get to have dinner with the guy who helps save over 25,000 lives a year, I kind of win. And if you lose, 
I win. You get free dinner. Sushi. Yeah. I get great sushi. So I kind of feel like I got the better of the deal. I win kind in both of, situations. Kind of. No, but I mean, I, you're, I think you're going to get this done. Like, I really think that, like, the aftermarket way of doing this, like, will lead to one of these manufacturers just being like, you know what? You know, Kia or whoever will be like, we're not going to get there in time. You've figured it out. Let's just license your stuff, put it in our car, and let's be ahead of everybody. Because you'll you'll be second or first. You'll be in the first two or three people because mm-hmm. it's all you're focused on. Yeah. Like the people at Mercedes have a, a million problems they have to deal with at Mercedes. And they're, they're, not, they're not software companies as much as they want to be. You know, maybe someday, but not right now. Yeah, they're going to have a long way to go. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're not... Yeah, going to MIT and taking all the robotics guys from iRobot or wherever. Oh, you took Tesla it. is, but you know the car company. Oh, is Tesla right. doing yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Because they do. What, what's your intelligence? Uh, your intel on the uh, Tesla autopilot? Because uh, obviously Elon tweeted. Yeah. Email me. You're going to report directly to me, and he did that like a year ago. Yeah. If people uh, remember, it's it's probably a top secret project. The only thing I know is is we're competing for talent. You know the top. Oh really? Is, yeah. So I, so I've people had, had offers from both. I've had more than one situation where you know it's someone someone says like, I have an offer from Tesla, which you know, is impressive that they're going after those kinds of people. Wow, that's legit. So yeah. basically, it's a two-horse race now, I'll say. It's you and Elon Musk. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but actually, that makes you... I mean, if someone like Elon Musk came to you and wanted to buy the company and you got to be part of that vision, that's not a terrible outcome, is it, for an entrepreneur? Uh, no, certainly not. I mean, yeah. we, we kind of have this vision of, of building the, the stuff that works across all cars. And, you know, uh, I think Tesla at this point is limited in distribution, so it's a little less interesting than maybe someone like Kia with sells more cars. But he does want to have the battery packs, the charging network, the mm-hmm. patents, everything go to all cars now. So he's becoming a little more with the Gigafactory and everything. He wants to provide the batteries for other cars. Right. And so... Oh, it's interesting. It's a good it point. might not. I, I kind of feel like Elon started to tip his cards a little bit. Like, you know, powered by Tesla could be something you'll see in other cars because they did build yeah. the Rav Four. Yeah. Well, let, let's not get us ahead of ourselves too yeah. much. I actually have to make the technology first. Yeah. So. yeah okay. <laughs> let's get back to work. All right. Listen, this has been an amazing episode. An hour goes by so quickly sometimes. Kyle, um, vote. Everybody fo- follow Kyle on. Uh, are you on Twitter? Yeah. K yeah. vote. K V O G T. K V O G T. V O G T. Cruise Automation Inc. is the company, and you can find them at getcruise.com. They're hiring, I'm sure, brilliant people. So if you're one of those brilliant people, I always like to say if you guess the uh, first name of the founder, the founder tends to get the email first name at That's right. company name. <laughs> Generally speaking, that doesn't go to the receptionist or a sales guy. Somebody maybe, maybe right. Maybe. So anyway, if you're a brilliant person, you might want to email Kyle and say, hey, hire me. Thanks again to our amazing partners for making this program possible. You know, a lot of work goes into the show these days. We've got studios. We've got Jackie, who is our Emmy award-winning producer uh, on the show. We've got Jacob, who is just an amazing artist who uh, produces all the great technology and uh, the graphics and everything that go with the show and sales and research and the, re- the launch ticker god there's like literally nine people work on the show now we couldn't do it without the great partners and thank you to we work for building me the studio here in san francisco go to wework.com and we will see you all next time on this week in startups bye bye